time tonight. I'm glad to be able to introduce for the second time this year, my colleague, neighbor on the rail campus, Professor Mark Basham, the Science Director for Artificial Intelligence and Informatics at the Rosman Franklin Institute, and also a principal or visiting scientist at the Diamond Light Source. I've worked with Mark in the past on data processing and storage, and Mark forms and directs teams across different disciplines to apply image processing techniques to solving difficult problems, making the best of new hardware. For example, the hardware which is installed at the Roger and Franklin Institute, very keen proponent of open source, and he's going to give us a fascinating talk this evening. So with that, over to you, Mark. Thank you very much. Okay, and thank you for inviting me to come and talk about um, stuff that I like almost as much as Raspberry Pis and uh, playing with hardware um, that's more commercially available. So with this one, I thought it would be really interesting to talk a little bit about the work that we've been doing with, um, you know, at the Rosalind Franklin Institute between physical and life sciences and how that actually that works. So who am I? I think I showed this slide last time, but just for anyone who didn't see, so um, my background is in physics. Um, uh, that's where my PhD is in sort of chaos theory, uh, but I've, uh, my degree was in physics with computer science and I've always had a real uh, passion for computer science and bringing it into the work I do. Currently that's predominantly in the areas of artificial intelligence. Um, I work at the Roslyn Franklin Institute, which is this brand new facility um, on the Harwell campus. Um, I'm Cornish, so if my accent is bewildering, that's where that's come from, although I have lived in Reading for quite a long time, so it's been killed a lot by that. I do enjoy public engagement and communication, things like the Raspberry, oh, sorry, the, the Lego Beamline in that case, and on Twitter. And I'm a real, uh, a really eco-friendly person now, so I ride an electric motorbike, which is incredibly good fun. So, why am I blending the physical and life sciences together? Well, a lot of that is because of where we work. And so here I'm at the Russell and Franklin Institute and Diamond Light Source, both of which use a lot of physical science mechanisms um, to bring sort of information into the life sciences. So for example, we use a particle accelerator to accelerate actions up to very close to the speed of light. And then we use the X-rays that are generated from that to look at protein structures and to look at biological things. At the Roslyn Franklin Institute, we do a lot of work with electron microscopes and uh, mass spectrometry, which are both very much physical processes that we bring to bear on cells and other sort of biological structures. So it's very much about bringing those two things together. So just a little bit about the Roslyn Franklin Institute. So it's a new national institute at Harwell. It's along the same lines as the Francis Crick Institute and the Alan Turing Institute. Um, it's funded by EPSLC, which I'll say in a second, but effectively the idea of us is that where the, Frank, uh, where the uh, Francis Crick Institute does incremental science, they have a lot of labs, and we have a lot of people doing really, really important research that sort of pushes forward gently. What um, a group of universities came together and said was that there was nowhere to do the transformational work. There was nowhere to do the stuff where it's a case of, well, this might work and it may have a massive impact, but it's a bit risky. So no one gets it funded. And that was very much the premise of us was about this idea of bringing together the, the sort of the right groups of people that could work together to have a go at some of these riskier projects with the idea that, well, not all of them are gonna work, but if one of them does, it could be transformational. It could have really big impact. So as I say, we're funded by EPSRC, which is quite interesting, although we have grant funding from various other places like the Wellcome Trust and stuff like this. Uh, but what's nice is although we're based on the Harwell campus, we are a completely separate entity. So we are a charity, um, which is quite nice. We get some bonuses out of being a charity. Our member institutes, um, we're quite interesting because we have a lot of universities as member institutes. So I think this ranges all the way from Southampton is our southernmost and Edinburgh is the northernmost. There's these 10 universities that all got involved at the beginning saying that they'd like someone to do this transformational research. And we have a couple of other groups. So Diamond is because they're our next door neighbour, they live just across the site and we actually do a lot of research with them. And SDFC are our landlords essentially, so they own the site we're on and we also collaborate with them from a computing point of view. So one of the key things about what we do is this factor of 10, and this is very much about the idea of we should only approach things that are potentially going to have this transformational impact. So 
can we make something 10 times faster or image something that's 10 times bigger or have a resolution that's 10 times better than it used to be? And we kind of break that around and we put that together around these, these sort of, um, I guess there, there are four values and they're things like adventure in that we should be trying to, we should be taking on risky projects. Novelty, we should be trying to create things that are unique and innovative. Our project should be engaging in terms of, we should be talking with groups of people from all over. We are quite a small group. There's about a hundred or so people at the Franklin at the moment. There's no way we can do all the projects we want to do. So collaboration is absolutely key. We just need to bring the right people together and then form the hub of that collaboration. And then utility, the idea is that we're not really a blue skies research facility. We're very, very targeted at particular problems that people have where they say, well, actually this would be great, but it's, it's okay what we're doing now, but if we could do it like this, then that would be transformation. So those are the sorts of areas we want to do. So I actually really didn't like this when I first saw it, but I'm, it's starting to grow on me, is this idea of life in five dimensions. And uh, so the idea here is that this is what we're ultimately trying to do. And we tried to come around one particular idea, and that was predominantly around imaging. And so our first three dimensions are 3D structure, so imaging in 3D. So this is using techniques like tomography or the various different electron microscopy techniques where you slice bits off the surface. Um, this is really useful because it creates massive volumes of data and data is an interesting thing for us, right? So that can be quite fun. But then we just start adding extra dimensions. So the time domain is something that we often don't see. Uh, a lot of the samples that we're interested in, especially biological samples, the only way to stop them from being destroyed is by either um, staining them or fixing them in various chemicals or by cryo fixing them, which means freezing them down to minus 170 odd degrees. Both of those make them very, very static. And so being able to do techniques that also explore the time domain, especially in 3D, are very, very interesting. And the final one, which is what the one I didn't like, because it's not really a dimension, which is chemistry. But then I started thinking about it. It's almost like the color channel in a photo. Kind of. I'm going to go with that as my analogy. So that's our fifth dimension is chemistry, because just knowing where the various bits of density are in 3D structures is great. But if you actually know that that's a gold atom and you actually know that this is this particular type of protein, that's much more valuable and you can get a lot of additional information. Out. So this is kind of the main area that we're focusing in. It's imaging in all these different ways. And to bring that together, we've got the different themes that live around that. So structural biology, next generation chemistry, um, imaging with measuring mass, imaging by measuring mass, time resolved imaging. And then there's another one at the bottom, which I'll leave out for the moment, because it's not really involved with the, the kind of collecting this, the sort of the data here. So just a little bit of an idea of some of the things that we've done, which are interesting. So the areas kind of the four, maybe, uh, the four sort of scientific themes that are doing the imaging techniques. One of them is looking at sort of cellular tomography. So this is the idea of, can we do, can we look inside entire cells? And actually we really want to push to looking inside um, uh, kind of tissue rather than just cells, because that's where all the really interesting things are. Things are very different when you uh, take them out of the cell, purify them to look at them. Whereas if you leave them in the cell. Um, there's an awful lot of work on sort of high throughput discoveries. This is chemicals, lots of different mixes of chemicals to try and identify ones that are interesting and then how they can impact biology. Um, the chemical imaging we've already talked about being able to identify different things and also time resolved imaging. So there's some interesting things around how uh, various different um, proteins, for example, you can watch them folding or you can watch them interacting, how enzymes work, these kinds of things. The one that I thought was relatively relevant, given what we've just all been through, is some of the work we did against, SARS, uh, against SARS-CoV-2, so that's COVID-19. So this is a really interesting piece of work around nanobodies. Um, I really like nanobodies. Uh, so uh, in our bodies, when we have an immune response, we create antibodies. Um, there are two categories of animals that create something called a nanobody, and as their name describes, they're much, much smaller, which means they're a lot easier for us to modify and use than antibodies are. Uh, and that's uh, the two creatures that create that are camelids and sharks. So as shark tanks were apparently out for our uh, research institute, we decided to go with llamas because they're the least evil of the camel family uh, for working with. But essentially what you do is, um, so these, camel, uh, these llamas are incredibly um, pampered, bless them. So what we do is we give them some, um, we don't infect them with COVID. What we do is we give them a small dose of just the spike protein 
So we just manufacture some spike protein in the lab. We give them a small dose of this, and then we leave them alone for about a month, giving them lots of hay and other exciting things to eat. And then we take a single drop of blood from them. And what we do is we look at all of the nanobodies that they've created to target that spike protein. Now, llamas are pretty decent, but they're not great. So what they've found is they've done a whole bunch of different ones that kind of work reasonably well. And then what we can do is we can take them and in the lab, we can just fiddle with them very slightly to try and make them better and better and better binders. And essentially the idea is that if we've got these nanobodies that connect onto the spike protein, the spike protein is the bit of the, the, the COVID virus that connects to you at the outside of your cells and then allows it to enter. If we fill it up with nanobodies, then it can't attach to your cell, therefore it can't enter. And I've now discovered the exciting world of trying to get things through from the development stage through to actually working on people. And it is a very, very slow process. Um, however, this does work amazingly well. It, it completely cures many of the models that we've tried it on so far uh, within a few days of administering. And you can administer it nasally, which is really cool. So um, watch this space in a few years time. Uh, so it's, it's all published work. And it's really interesting, but at the same time, it does take a while to come through. But it is a, a phenomenal uh, sort of interesting piece of work. And it's one of the things that came out of some of the initial work that we did at the Franklin. However, oh, sorry, one last thing. I did want to speak a little bit about um, Rosalind Franklin herself, uh, especially prominent around Ada Lovelace Day and, and these kinds of things. Um, so I'm definitely not an expert on her life and times. There are various bits and pieces. It's quite controversial. There's some interesting stuff in there. Um, generally, I think she was she um, was not rewarded as much as she should have been for the work that she did um, for most of the time she was um, alive, which is a real shame. One of the things that the reason why our institute is named after her is because of the work that she did specifically on DNA, where she brought physical science techniques to the life sciences to essentially to explore and to understand them. So photograph 51, which is the classic one, is using X-ray crystallography to look at the structure of DNA and that sort of structure you only get from a double helix, which is where that was the data which Watson and Crick then took to basically make the, make the essential discoveries. So as I say, very, very, um, yeah, I think um, a different time from a while back, it wasn't quite as, uh, as, as well balanced as it is now, uh, but at the same time, uh, an excellent person for our institute to be based on. However, moving back to what we, we're interested in, right, which is AI and computing and stuff, we've got all this cool biology, but, but what are we doing? And that's the little bit at the bottom here, artificial intelligence and informatics. And where we fit in is all around trying to make sure that all of this stuff actually works in a reasonably nice way, because a lot of the steps of this process are really complicated and time consuming. Actually, it's, it's actually, Quite a few of them are not that complicated they're just very time consuming and trying to get around that is really important and so my group or well, my theme at the franklin um sorry we recently put together a mission statement so i'm literally putting in every presentation i give at the moment to, to try and get the most out of it but essentially we're yeah we're a group of software engineers research software engineers and we've got a few domain experts in things like um uh, in sort of computer science based so machine learning uh, machine vision those kinds of things and basically what we're trying to do is put together the infrastructure for the rest of the facility to use that makes that they means they can deal with the data they're collecting. They're not dealing with small amounts of data, they're collecting large quantities of data. We want them to be able to deal with it effectively, but we also want to be able to accelerate all the science they do with this. So rather than them collecting 20 terabytes of data, having three large hard drives that they put on their shelf and go, well, I'll let a PhD student deal with them in some point in the future, we want them to actually be able to use it and, and get the best out of it. So that kind of leads a little bit to the theme makeup. There's kind of two, two halves to it. One half is kind of my, the core group and they deal with the, the sort of the infrastructure side, making sure that we, we get, make the most out of the data we've got. Uh, and also trying to use all of the standard techniques because we don't want to be going off creating our own thing. So we want to be using sort of the, the more techniques that, every, you know, that, are, that are more mainstream, that are more commercially viable, things like, object stores for dealing with data rather than trying to build these really big file systems, um, things like using um, cloud infrastructure as a way of scaling stuff. All of this sort of the more standard techniques, we're trying to make use of those. And then we also have our R&D group, which are looking at techniques and looking at specific items and trying to work out how to solve the problems that we see in those particular areas. So a little bit on data management and exploitation. So 
I think at the moment there are about 21 instruments at the Franklin that we support. Um, they range from um, you know, NMR machines that collect a small amount of data or reasonably big instruments like electron microscopes that collect vast quantities of data on a daily basis. That partially deals with our transfer. So we've, we've had to so far deal with things like 20 terabytes a day of data being transferred between ourselves and Diamond from some of the large instruments that have, have um, come along. And we've got about 160,000 items in our metadata catalog where we store all of the information that's been collected across the whole facility. So one of the things that we're trying to do as an institute is make sure that all of the data that's collected is managed and all brought together. So we've got a large database that contains that. And you can kind of see here, uh, those of you who recognize Grafana charts might notice this. Uh, so here's a nice plot of how much data we're using on the central sort of the, our central object store. Um, about six months ago, it was about 50 terabytes. It's now just over 250 terabytes. Uh, we have six petabytes of storage available because we were expecting to ramp up a little bit quickly, more quickly, but COVID turns out during the building of your building is very difficult to, to deal with in a nice way. Um, but this will be, as you can see, I'm still trying to convince myself I can fit a line through that and not an exponential curve, but I don't think I'm going to be able to for long. So let's go back to this sort of blending idea. So I've talked about the AI. Oh, and just one thing about AI. I deliberately called it AI because I didn't want to get narrowed down to anything specific. So I didn't want to just be about machine learning. There's also all the optimization elements. There's loads of other things that come in AI that I wanted to kind of encompass. So it's sort of, I always think of AI as more just algorithmic work for sort of computational methods. And it, it means that I can do what I want and sort of still within my remit, which is nice. But back to the sort of blending. So instrumental development, that's a clear thing. We're applying these really cool physical science instruments to biological sciences and we're getting some good stuff. But actually AI is a really significant part of this because often we collect these big quantities of data that we need to analyze or the technology development just doesn't work quite as well as you want it to, but you can maybe solve that with some software in the right place. So what I wanted to do was talk about a specific problem. So this example problem is uh, cryo-electron tomography. So the idea of cryo-electron tomography is that you collect a sequence of images as you rotate a sample, and you slowly but surely build up a 3D representation of that object. And because it's electron microscopy, you can do this on very small things. So this is generally looking inside a cell. So this is a, a single cell. And the challenge that we've got, or the problem that we've got, is that the data we actually collect looks a bit like this. It's kind of a big, noisy, gray mass of stuff. What we really want is this nicely colored diagram that shows all the different things that we're interested in. Because this you can do science on, right? This I can say, how many of these little green, I think these are ribosomes, how many of these little ribosomes are there? Where are they densest in the cell? Where are they closer to the walls? Are they further away from the walls? What's the volume inside these different areas? How does that change if we look at a diseased cell or a healthy cell? Whereas I can't really do any of that with this because it's just a big block of grayscale information. So the premise of going from this to this is what we're really interested in. And the reason we're interested in it at the moment is because the way at the moment you go from this to this is manual. So someone will sit down and they will start tracing around the outside of these with a pen and they'll start labeling it and annotating it manually. And then after they've finished annotating this, they'll move down one slice or maybe down two slices and interpolate, and they'll do the whole thing again and again. And this can take two to three months of someone's effort to fully go through and annotate one of these if they're doing it completely manually. It takes about half an hour to collect the data. So as you see, unless we were to literally fill the Franklin with PhDs and postdocs and researchers, just doing this all the time, we would never keep up with one of these instruments in terms of stuff. So what happens at the moment is that people will cherry pick the data because they have to. So they won't look at all the data, they'll look at one case. And actually, from a sort of scientific point of view, that's, that's not so great because you're looking at a single case that happens to have worked well and given you a nice image that you can work with rather than looking at an ensemble of like 20 or 30 candidates so that you can really look at the statistics. So sometimes they do do that, but it takes them a long time. That can be an entire PhD. So there we go, there's our problem. So if we sort of explore it a little bit, so there's a few problems. The first one is that this is not a great image. This is actually slightly zoomed out. So the, the detector wasn't collecting at the, the full resolution. 
but actually the electrons we use absolutely destroy the sample. So you've got a very limited amount of dose you can use. You've got a limited number of images you can take before you destroy the sample. And what that means is that we end up with lots and lots of noise in the sample. We also end up with quite a few interesting um, artifacts around the fact that we can't take that many images where we'd want to take lots of different angles. We can't take that many. So there's lots of other artifacts that come in here. And also a lot of the data is pretty washed out because it doesn't really pick up the difference between the, the most of this is kind of basically carbon. And so the difference between one bit of carbon and another bit of carbon is pretty similar and it's a bit difficult to really see. So there's a lot of issues with the way that the data is collected uh, that makes it challenging. The second thing we want to do is really want to identify um, so stuff and things to use the technical terms. So things are things like a microtubule, so it's a specific thing, or one of these ribosomes that you can see down here, or in this case, these are viruses, so these are rear viruses. Um, and the stuff are kind of bigger blobs, so it's these regions like a lipid drop or a mitochondria down the side there. And the reason we're interested in kind of the stuff is because stuff contains things, but it generally contains a smaller subset of things than everything else. So it can be quite useful. If we go inside a mitochondria, we know what should be in there. And that allows us to identify things a little bit more easily. And once we've identified all of the things, then we can do the simple task of grouping those things together into similar groups. And then what you can do is you can do things like match them up. And because you've actually got loads of different potential orientations and the fact that proteins generally go to roughly the same shape, you can start doing things like averaging them together to get better, better results. And that allows us to go down to really high resolution images and understand sort of atomic and molecular information about the systems we're looking at. Uh, but that's all reasonably challenging. So, but what it would do is it would allow us to fully describe this cell in a way that a machine is then able to interpret further. So let's look at the steps where we've tried to use AI to approach some of these problems. So step zero, so the, the, before we even start, actually there's a really big problem around sample preparation. It is really hard to make a sample that you can actually put in an electron microscope. And um, so this is a chameleon instrument, it's made by SPT Lab Tech, and they produce a load of sample preparation bits of equipment. Uh, this is one we've been working with. This is a really cool piece of kit, but one of the things that's special about it is it uses these very tiny um, electron microscopy grids. So they're about three millimeters across. They're very, very small, but they're where you put your sample. And just to give you an idea, so this is looking at it from an optical microscope. Hopefully I can make this play. So if we zoom in on it, so we've got some initial optical data, and then we go into a low resolution scanning electron microscope. And then we go into a high res montage of scanning electron microscope images. And you can see on top of this grid, they've actually grown nanowires. And that's really important. Those little nanowires sort of suck liquid away. And so it enables us to get these very, very thin films of, um, of sample that we're interested in so we can see through them. And so this is then doing some 3D FibSem on top of this to actually get the 3D structure. And so actually, SBT Lab Tech are really interested in this structure because they grow this on all of their, um, all of the, their grids. And as I say, these grids are three millimeters across. They're difficult to manually handle. But their QA process at the moment is that somebody has a look at all of them and puts some of them under a microscope and looks at them. And it's an incredibly laborious QA process that actually means these cost quite a bit of money because quite a few get rejected during that QA process. And it's a time consuming part. So one of the things that we were interested in was, well, can we do some interesting things with this? Can we use machine learning to maybe infer some information or at least identify where bad grids are so that you can maybe just reject them? So for example, this one is classed as a bad grid because it's got a strike across it there and there's some growth in on the side there, there's some corrosion. So this is kind of the classic problem that you may throw artificial intelligence at. You can actually throw slightly simpler than artificial, well, you can actually say slightly simpler than machine learning at it because you can pick up some differences between a good grid and a bad grid just simply on the way that it reflects the light back when you collect the data on the microscope. These nanowires, interact with light in interesting interference ways, which means you get some, some reasonable signal off it to, to pick that up. However, you can also start looking at them in a bit more detail on the microscope, collect a, a load of data. And if you start doing some simple techniques like PCA, you can start to divide and find a nice break between the 
uh, between the good grids and the bad grids. And that enables you to train up a system where you can start just looking at them. And at the moment, we're working with SPT Lab Tech on a way of acquiring information on lots of their grids at one time so we can apply this technique uh, multiple times. Where I'd really like to push it is we've got these high resolution images and we can match them back up to uh, the, the, the sort of the visual images. Is there any way of from the visual image inferring what's going on at the nanoscale? Because if we illuminate with various different wavelengths of light, we might be able to pick up some of that information. And this is uh, some initial work on that where we've started trying to predict on the visual image what the nanoscale properties are. The reason why we're interested in that is because not always do you want to know every, you don't always want the full grid to be available. And I guess it's the same as like Intel chips at one point where they would test all four cores and if only three of them worked, they'd switch off the one that didn't work, Dan brand it as a seller on and then sell it anyway. You can do the same thing with these, right? You can say, well, these are your gold standard grids, these are your silver standard grids and they're slightly cheaper as long as you've got a mechanism for doing that. Okay, so that's step zero. We've made a few bits of progress in terms of making sample preparation a bit easier. So let's go to step one, which is to reduce the artifacts. And here's another place where we can use machine learning. But again, it's, it's a completely different people, people, a different group of people now who are doing this. So this is uh, one of my PhD students, Dimitrios Bellos, uh, who was a PhD student when he did this, he's now um, graduated. But what he was looking at was using deep neural networks to in-paint sinograms. And let me explain what I mean by that. When you collect a, uh, an, a data set uh, for tomography, you take an image of your sample, you then rotate it a little bit and you take another image, you rotate it a bit and take another image. If we've got a slab, which is often what we've got, you kind of do that backwards and forwards. Sometimes you can get a cylinder and then you do it all the way around. But the problem you've got, as I said earlier, is you've got this limited number of doses you can take. And so what he was interested in was, well, I've got some data that's good, but I've got gaps that are not good. And can I infer what's in the gaps from the real data that I've got? And one of the things that, I think this will make a little bit more sense if I go to the next slide actually, where you can see, this is what a, a full reconstruction looks like with all of the information there, full sinogram, sorry. So this is on my hand, if you imagine taking a single line through there, and as I rotate, taking the image from that single line. So that's as I rotate, and this is my sort of single line. So a full tomogram would be a stack of these. You can see these lovely sort of sonogram patterns. It's like, well, I can kind of by eye see what's going on with this. I could follow this. So surely a machine learning algorithm could pick up those features. And what we actually have is we have an image that looks like this, where there's bits missing out of this image. And all we really want to do is just kind of interpolate and color in the gaps. Some of the standard interpolation methods do a pretty good job of this, but we, yeah, we may be able to do better. And the reason we want to is when you introduce these, if you reconstruct this, you get this beautiful image here, which is exactly where your 3D objects are. When you reconstruct this, you start getting all of these like streaky line artifacts because you haven't sampled all the information you need. And those streaky artifacts can start dampening out some of your smaller features. And that can make it really difficult to actually infer and interpret what's going on. So what we don't want to do is we don't want to really increase the data. What we want to do is reduce the noise. That's the, the important thing. And so to do that, we use a, a kind of a, a unit segment or a unit mechanism that you put in your input volume. And what it produces is it produces an output volume that effectively fills in all the gaps. And the way we train it is by giving it the data that you want it to fill in and artificially creating gaps in it in bits of the good data. Because what we don't want to do is we don't want to train on some other data and then apply it to our information. Because there's something with deep learning. And if you've seen any of the stuff that comes from, from Google with all the deep dream stuff where you seed the algorithm with something and it goes, well, actually, I'm going to just think this looks like a cat because I've seen billions of pictures of cats. And therefore that's what my network is just gonna sort of gravitate towards. So the last thing we want in scientific data is to introduce artifacts, hallucinations from the data we've trained off. What we want to do is make sure that only things that are in the data we're using are there. So this is an interesting method where we train up on just the data we're using, and then we reapply that. And that's why actually these little gaps here 
are not regular because we deliberately make them irregular so that we can use uh, for better training data. And just to give you an idea of how this works on sort of real systems, here's some uh, here's a, a fake data set that's been collected uh, more accurately. There's a whole bunch of gaps in it. And you can see at the end is the in-painted one. And it's a bit of a zoom in just so you can see the gaps a little bit more clearly. The in-painting also reduces the noise slightly, which is quite interesting. And how this then looks, here's our original data set with, with no noise effectively. Here's the one where we're missing those gaps. And you can see actually the bit that's interesting to look at is these sort of small circular features here. But you can see quite clearly these rings go all the way in. Whereas here they're completely shrouded by the noise at this point. Whereas after the in-painting, you start retrieving some of them back, which is great because we're reducing the noise. Okay, so we've reduced the noise. So we've got slightly better data to work with. So now we want to find the stuff. And so again, we're now going to segue to a completely different group of people in my, my team who are working on a piece of software called Servos Workbench. And this is, um, this is a piece of software that's written in Python, and it's all about trying to segment these complicated systems, these complicated 3D volumes of data. And so how it works, it uses a load of different techniques. Um, the first one we use, which is really cool, is called super voxels or super pixels. They're an amazing technique. If you ever do image processing and you want to make your problems easier, super pixels are an amazing idea. So what you do is you take an image and you cover it in these little sort of these aggregate super pixels. And what they do is they follow all the contours of your image. And if you actually replace just every single block of the, um, the pixels with the average color of that block, you get a pretty decent picture of a bear. It's not perfect, but it's basically, in this case, it's, uh, there's only, um, well, I think in this case, it's something like there's um, 2 million pixels versus, um, what is it, something like um, 200 super voxels. So you reduce the problem by almost three or three or four orders of magnitude in terms of the way that you deal with it. And although, yes, you do lose a little bit of data because of the edge preserving nature, it's not as much as you think. So you can get some really good results. So we use super voxels to reduce our problem. In our case, it's taking it from a 200 million voxel space down to 200K super voxels. And then we use a whole bunch of different algorithms. So we've got our reconstruction, We've already tidied up a little bit. We apply some smoothing, some edge detection, some gradients, some um, you know, texture filters and stuff like this. And what that does is it gives us a whole selection of information for each of these super voxels. And so then for each of the super voxels, we can apply standard machine learning methods. And in fact, in this case, we're using sort of shallow learning techniques. So these are things like support vector machines or decision trees, decision forests. And the idea is that our user, because that's whose life we're trying to make easier, draws a line. In this case, we're looking at the nucleus of a cell versus the cytoplasm. They draw a line in the nucleus and they draw a line in the cytoplasm and then they press go. And what it's going to try and do is it's looking at all of the super voxels in the whole space and it's trying to work out which set they belong to based on the training data we've given it. And um, if you've worked on this example a lot and know where to put those lines, you can get it to pretty much uh, effectively sort of, sorry, oops. You can get it to estimate the, the areas pretty accurately. If you get it wrong, because it only takes a few seconds, so it's about 30 seconds or so to apply these methods because we've reduced the problem space so much, you can just patch up the bits that are wrong and then reply, apply it again. So it's pretty quick to get to a reasonable answer. But this was a problem we had was that it was pretty quick to get to a reasonable answer, but it wasn't great to get to a brilliant answer. And actually, if you started scaling up into really big systems, it became really problematic. And so that's when we moved to the exciting world of Servos 2, which is unimaginatively named. But what we looked at here was adding deep learning segmentation into this as well. So the idea is you take a small region and you segment it using those classical methods, but then you go straight into a standard sort of UNET mechanism, which you train using that data to then segment the whole thing. So when we started doing this, one of the things we looked at was 3D segmentation. Uh, 3D segmentation is really tricky because those 3D kernels use up a lot of GPU memory. And even though we've got access to some pretty cool GPUs, we've just got access to some of the 80 gig new A100s, which are very, very cool. 
However, even with that, you can't go up to too big data because by the time you run the training sets through, it's very difficult. So one of the things we were looking at was whether uh, how we can use 2D, uh, 2D um, CNNs to do the same job, uh, the same sort of job. And what we do is we basically break it down and we look at the data in all three different directions because we've got the volume data. We train using all of that data. And then when we do a prediction, we predict on all three different directions. And in fact, the bit that we do, which is quite interesting, is we then not only predict on the three different directions, we also flip the data and rotate it and predict, in fact, in 12 different ways. So each voxel in our space, we know from 12 different viewpoints what the network thinks it is. And that allows us to not only identify reasonably accurately what the voxel is, but also how uncertain we are. So if six things say it's one thing and six things say it's the other, then we know we're really uncertain about what it actually is. But if like 10 things say it's one and only two say it's the other, we're pretty sure we know what, um, what the label is. And so what that enables us to do is this kind of workflow here, where we start off with our, our data, we apply the filters, like I was saying earlier, we put our super voxels on, we draw some pretty minimal annotations with our super voxels. We then use the shallow learning to fill in all of the gaps. And you can see it's actually done a pretty shonky job. There's a few bits that are wrong. But what we found was that when you then move to deep learning and you use this as the training data and reapply it, it actually gets a lot of those bits right. Sorry, I will. I meant to move me earlier. There we go. It actually gets a lot of those bits right. And you can see it's actually filled in a lot of the mistakes because in general, we're correct. And so the deep learning will actually learn more about it. It notices that we've been uh, inconsistent, but it notices that more often than not, we've done the right thing. And so it can fix up those problems. And the great thing about this is that once we've applied it here, we can then apply it to the entire data set. So here's our little region that we've, we've worked on. We now apply it to the whole data set and we actually get a pretty decent segmentation. There's a little bit up here that it doesn't do right and that's due to the size of our kernels. We need to go a little bit bigger to, to get that working, but actually it does a pretty nice job, which is really good. And the key thing here is, yeah, the time estimates, to do it completely manually would have taken someone two months to fully annotate this data set. With the super region work, they'd still have to go around it in chunks but it would be quicker. So it would take them probably a month, maybe three weeks. But with the super region and the units, we're down to sort of four hours. It's very, very quick for somebody to annotate a small region and then apply it. The data I'm showing here though is a bit of a cheek since it's x-ray data and it's slightly nicer quality than the EM data. EM won't work out as well as this, but it will still work reasonably nicely. Okay, so we've done our step two, we've got those regions and now we wanna match all the things. And, um, this is kind of classically, uh, so minor amounts of CS. Uh, so I, I will call this an MP hard problem because I believe it is, because what you're interested in is in your system, you want to see every repeat of any structure in any orientation. So it's the classic kind of pattern matching, but where we don't know the pattern. And we want to infer the pattern from what patterns appear lots in the data. So I think it is a really challenging problem. And we've worked, so in this particular case, we're working with some groups to try and address that problem in a nice way. So we're working with the Alan Turing Institute directly. We're working with CCPEM, which is the Electron Microscopy Collaborative Computational Project Group. Um, and we've got a few people who are working on this project in an attempt to try and come up with a reasonable solution to this. We just released some, some work actually, which is our current working hypothesis on how we think this can work. And again, we're using some deep learning methods, but in this case, we're using an autoencoder uh, because we don't have that much training data. And so what the autoencoder does is it takes an input, it runs it through an encoder that we train, it puts this into a latent representation, which is basically just a reduced amount of information, usually a vector of some description that describes sort of the inner workings. And then you decode that vector representation back into your output, which is your original protein structure that you're interested in. And what we're into, what we do is we normally you just train the encoder and the decoder, and you just let it do what it what it does normally. And it's a bit like compression and decompression. The idea is if you make your latent representation nice and small, your encoder and decoder have to learn how to do useful things. They have to learn, they can't just learn exactly how to replicate the data. 
they have to kind of do more inference and you're training it with lots of inputs and lots of outputs. So what we do is we break this up a little bit and we put it into sort of the standard, um, uh, what is it, standard beta VAE, which is this mu and sigma sort of sampling here. But we also had a pose estimation. And the idea here is to break up the idea of you've got the shape of the object, but you've also got its position in space. And by breaking those two up, the way we do that is by clustering this first part and we cluster that based on similarity. So what we say is as we put the training data through, we look at how similar different things are. And so the test we did with this was the standard sort of alpha numeric or sort of alpha case of different letters. And what we look at is how similar the different letters are. And if you then cluster that latent space, and in this case, we're representing it in two dimensions. So we just sort of get rid of it, although it's actually probably more like 10 or so. Um, what we find is we find that because we've forcibly clustered it, you end up with these different blobs. And the nice thing is that these blobs are ones that are nearby to one another are letters that are similar, ones that are far away are letters that are very dissimilar from one another. Um, the way you do the clustering and the, the metric you use for similarity makes a big difference. If we use some nice methods, we get this lovely one. If we use a slightly worse technique, you get a big mix of things which doesn't cluster out quite as nicely. But if you choose good, good sort of values, you get this lovely clustering in our latent space. And that's really useful because when we then start applying it to proteins, what you get is you get different clusters in your latent space around your different clusters. And you can see that the clusters that are close to one another, the types of protein look pretty similar to one another, which is really great. Why this is better than just running through a system where we say, but why can't we just like directly classify? Why are we doing all this latent space stuff in the middle? The reason we're really interested in it is because of this element. This little blob here, this cluster, was a protein that we put in that was completely unseen by the network in training. So the network had never seen this protein. But when we put it through the autoencoder, it ends up putting it somewhere close to ones that look similar, but it's still in its own unique place and it's still a cluster. So if we go back and identify, if we go back and look at this later, we can say, yeah, okay, these ones are clearly this, these ones are clearly this, but actually we've got this other cluster here, we should investigate it. But all of the things in this cluster are pretty much the same item. And that's where we're really interested because it, it means that we can train on a lot of data, but if there's something that's different, which there almost certainly will be in these big objects and these big sort of volumes of data, it will fall in a different space on here. And so then the idea is that you work through the whole of your volume space that looks very messy. You take out little blocks, you look at where they end up on your latent space, you then cluster your latent space together, use the pose estimation that you've got separately to work out what orientation it should be. You can average them together and then pop them back in and fully automatically annotate your whole data set. We'll highlight this is possibly future work and maybe doesn't exist quite yet, but the theory is there and that's a so working hypothesis. We've got some of the stuff at the beginning, but we're now working on scaling up to make it work with really large data sets, which becomes challenging from a computational point of view, because getting it working on a small data set is one thing, but when you start then trying to throw several, you know, hundred terabytes of data at it to give it enough data to train on effectively, it becomes challenging. So, the one problem I've discussed there involves a large number of different people, multiple steps, multiple different groups involved in the different systems. And I've basically talked about something that happens in one room down here. So I appreciate, I think I appreciate, I'm running out of time. So I just wanted to very quickly go over a couple of the other things that we do as well that are quite interesting. So one of the systems, we have this amazing, on the top floor, we have this amazing robot that does all kinds of chemical mixing. So what you say is you say, you can basically give it a bunch of chemicals and it will automatically mix them together, put different reaction conditions on, and it allows you to explore loads of different systems. However, it does only pretty much cap out at about 400 different reactions in one go for it doing a cycle. And what the, the scientists are often interested in is, okay, well, I've got a thousand of compound A and I've got a thousand of compound B. So which 400 of all of the different combinations, that thousand by thousand different combinations, so a million different combinations, which 400 should I choose 
to be the most representative of all of the experiments I could do to give me the widest sampling. And that's a really interesting problem for a lot of reasons. Uh, but it's also interesting because they then say things like, oh yeah, but there's some limitations, of course. I can only use 40 different chemicals because I've only got 40 vials on the robot. And I don't really want to spend more than a grand on chemicals. So if you can keep it within these bands. So it's a really interesting sort of bounded problem, but also a combinatoric problem. And so actually one of the one of my team is working on this and he's done some really cool stuff where we've looked at some of the different representations and different ways of comparing different chemicals together to get like a score and actually we're clustering in a similar way to the we were doing with similarity we're clustering on that similarity and then sort of trying to spread evenly over that these initial sample points and then what's quite cute with these is because you know you don't really care where they are you just want them to be roughly in the right place so you can do a little local search around all of them and say is there anybody really close to me that's cheaper so you can just nudge some of the points to get your price down below the price point that they want to do. Because essentially, I think the, the difference in price of some of the chemicals is orders of magnitude. It's like, you know, some things cost literally a few pound for a litre of it, and some things cost, you know, thousands of pounds for a few millilitres. So it's really, it's a really interesting problem. Another one that we, we do, and this, so that one sort of uses some of the deep learning and clustering methods or deep clustering methods. This one's an interesting one, which is all about um, uh, sorting magnetic arrays of systems. So this is actually for one of our collaborators, so a group we work with at Diamond, um, who want these. So these are really cool. They're called insertion devices, and they they put them, they insert them into the beam basically, and they make the electron beam wiggle from side to side that generates the really bright light that they use to create the X-rays. And the problem is that each of these magnets is uh, they're all these like neodymium magnets, so they're super powerful. It's really hard to make them perfect. And they're, they're arranged in a thing called a Halbacher array, which means you've got one that's pointing up, one that's pointing left, one that's pointing down, and they kind of cycle round. The problem is they're never perfect. They're always slightly misaligned because of the manufacturing process. And so the problem you have is that you want to, with the set of magnets that you've got and all their imperfections, you want to put them together in a way that cancels those imperfections out. And the problem with the magnetic fields is they're really long range. So you end up with lots and lots of impact. The one we've got pictured here is actually one of the really short ones. Most of the, some of these are five meters long and have like 200 magnets per, per frame on the bottom of the top. And um, so this is a, a traditional optimization problem. What was interesting about it though, was we tried, we thought about using genetic algorithms, which is the sort of go-to place for optimization. But because it's a sorting problem with a genetic algorithm, you can end up with having the same magnet in the same uh, the, the same magnet twice in a solution if you bring the, the bits together in the wrong way. So you often have to fix it and it can break it a little bit. And there's also some problems about us recalculating the whole magnetic field because we have to simulate it. It's really time consuming to recalculate a whole magnetic field. So what we actually started doing was a different technique, which is called um, uh, artificial immune systems. And so instead of being based on, um, I guess, the population dynamics of, uh, you know, survival of the fittest as a genetic algorithm is, this is based on how your immune system fights infection. It's based on very, very rapid mutation. So what you do is you basically start off with an initial population and you rank them by quality. The best quality ones, you create lots of duplicates of and you mutate them only a very little bit. So you can see here we're only mutating a couple of the, or you sort of just do a small amount of mutation on them. Then as you go down, what you do is you start creating less of them, but you create, sorry, have I got this small around? No, no, that's right. You create less of them, but you mutate them more. And then when you get to the really, really worst one, you don't create very many of them, but mutate it lots. So this one's been mutated twice. This one's been mutated three times. And the idea is that your really good population members just explore their local space and try and find things that are close to them that might be good. Your bad population members get thrown off all over the place because they're being mutated lots and lots. And as I say, it's exactly how your immune system works. And because we're only doing small numbers of mutations, we can actually do that really computationally effectively for our simulation, which is really beneficial. So it was quite an interesting one because my default was to always go for genetic algorithms because they're just the best. But actually, this ended up being a lot quicker because of the, the sort of shortcuts you could take. So with that, 
hopefully that's given you a reasonable kind of overview of all of the things that we do. So we use AI for a lot of the different stuff we do. And it really does integrate really closely with a lot of the experimental work we do. Um, thank you very much for your time. Let me talk about it for a second. Thank you. Let's make our speaker. Okay, we have some questions from the room. Go ahead, please. Um, uh, thank you very much, Lord. That's right. Fantastic. Um, sorry, I'm a bit, uh, I just wonder if you could explain a bit more. Uh, so, the BAEs, yeah. so for instance, I use BAEs for single cell RNA sequencing data in which the, the input is a matrix, the gene expression matrix for each cell. Yeah. Uh, what's, how, what is the input to your BAE for the? For uh, so, yeah, so the input to our BAE, sorry, I, I skimmed that. Let me find the picture. So actually, the input to the VAE is a 3D block of um, electron density, basically. So it's it's effectively it's the electron density map that comes from a protein structure. Okay. Um, I say that it's not; it's the Coulombic interaction, whatever it is the electrons find. It's slightly different, but it's essentially the electron density map that you get. So we simulate that from the PDB structure that we've already got, so the, the structure of the system. But it's basically it's a 3D block of data. Um, and then yes, we we that's what we use as the, the thing. So it's kind of a, a volume representation, an image representation. Could I also ask in terms of the segmentation um, and classification? Yeah. How does when you find that you're changing the scales, like you mentioned from X-ray to um uh, priority, priority, um, how do you find the differences in the methods you as in the adjusting the parameters? So yeah, actually the that's one of the niceties of having the image feature step at the beginning. So with the shallow learning, there, there are, you're right, there's quite a lot of sort of tweaking that you can do with choosing the right type of smoothing, the right features. But once you've got that step done, all the rest of the flow is very, very similar. So although there are some differences in those initial steps, actually it's, it's quite quick to iterate this. And so you can make those changes nicely. But yeah, you're absolutely right. You can't take one and use it on the other. So we've focused on X-ray because it's a little bit easier to do. Still challenging with biological systems, but it's easier than the uh, than the electron tomography systems. Um, okay. And were you able to use pre-trained models on other, you know, the, the, the models that people train from the internet, um, the, from the internet? So what we found is that there's a few of them, so you have to match the experimental conditions really closely. That's the biggest problem. And we've not really had much success with anyone that's been trained if it's not been trained on exactly our instruments and exactly those systems. I think it's the, it's, it's the classic problem we've got with scientific data is we've got such a little, you know, if you go to cats, there are so many photos of cats that you've got every possible conceivable configuration you can do, it, you can use it. When we train our models for the for the scientific data, generally what we're doing is we're using a network that's already been pre-trained on cats. And we're then just doing a small amount of update training to make it work for cells or whatever. And that small amount of update training isn't enough to generalize it more than the very, very local environment. So the yeah, we find that sometimes actually, if we're not careful when we do this is a nice sample because we've got it's really homogeneous and it's really clean most of the time we do one region and apply it and it only works for a certain amount and then we have to take another region train that and it slowly but surely builds up to being the whole thing that's there so yeah it's yeah you're absolutely right it's a challenging area and we we've not had that much luck with using pre-trained models that's why we train all our own from, from scratch but we would love some nice pre-trained models on loads of data that looks more like us our data rather than cats and dogs and natural images because we have to play a lot of tricks to make this pretend it's an actual image. We have plenty of time for questions. Do we have any questions from Zoom? Um, no, 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 questions right now. So I was intrigued. Um, you're developing open source software. That which I didn't talk about at all. I'm really sorry. No, that's okay. I wondered if some of the techniques you're forming with uh, collaborating with equipment manufacturers are they widely available or are they? Propriety. No, absolutely. So one of the, which I'm really surprised at, but one of the deals we made with um, some of the manufacturers we work with is that the software that we release would be open source, mm -hmm. but would be accessible to them. So we deliberately open source all our software with a permissive license. So we use Apache V2, 
because it enables manufacturers to essentially package it and sell it as part of their product, mm -hmm. but not sell it themselves. If that, so they can't sell it on its own, but they can sell it as part of their product, um, but they have to accredit us with it. So it means that if anybody does want to use it without using their software, they they can, but if it's convenient for them to use it, then they will. Without right, using their hardware. So, sorry, yes, exactly, yeah. yeah. So essentially that means that we actually get the best of both worlds because we get the stuff that we're working on potentially distributed with the vendor equipment. Mm -hmm. um, but if somebody does want to use it completely, uh, so all, yeah, so I should have said all of our software is open source, it's all freely available. Use it if you want to segment random things. <laughs> so is that actually linked on the RFI website? Is there a um, software? No, so we just have a, so we have a, we should put a software page. We just have a, so all of our Rebel, software, yeah. it's, it's um, GitHub. So yeah. we have Roslyn Franklin Institute on GitHub. So if you, if you look there, that's where all of our software is. Great. Yeah. Including a lot of the stuff that we do for, yeah, pretty much everything we do is on there. There's a few, a lot, even a lot of our infrastructure stuff. So some of the stuff we do for infrastructure, we use things like Ansible mm -hmm. for running a lot of our infrastructure. I think quite a bit of that is on there. There's a few bits that we keep closed because it has the secret keys and all those sorts of things in it. But anything that can be made open, we by default make open if we can. Yeah, and in terms of software engineering, you mentioned research software engineers and they're having the ninth anniversary. Yes, yes. So is there some sort of impetus to um, encourage that in RFI? So every member of my team is a research software engineer. And that's what we advertise for when we recruit mm -hmm. is research software engineers. And so I would say it's an interesting one because when we had the conversation reasonably recent from the RSE group, um, I think most of our RSEs are from the traditional approach or the traditional entry route, which is that they've gone into research, they've done their PhD or they've done some research, they don't really want to continue the academic style but really enjoy the software development and have then moved to RSE. What we're really interested in is getting people from other routes because that, you know, that route can't be the only route into RSE because it's not a huge pool of people. And different so, scientific domains, I guess. Right, exactly. Yeah. So um, actually, yeah, it's, it'd be really nice to get people in from different different um, avenues. So we've started looking a little bit at that um, in terms of how we can do it, in that we we don't require certain things. We're a lot more open about yeah, what we want. Yeah. You're more interested in aptitude, I guess. Right, exactly. Yeah. And so, yeah, there's there's a lot of... Uh, so I think you need to have a certain interest in the science from the <laughs> point of view of we end up talking to a lot of... You know, all of our, our customers and our partners are generally biologists and stuff, so I have a bluffer's guide for biologists. I think I used all of my biology words in this talk because I tried to exercise them. <laughs> Um, and if you'd have asked me about what any of the other blobs on any of those images were, not a clue. Um, but um, yeah, you need to have that kind of that slight level so you can talk to people. But actually, you learn that from a little bit of um, time. And everything else is just: Are you interested in solving the problems, pick out the challenges? So I guess you have a lot of lab space available for new exciting instruments. You'd think so, but I think we've filled it up. Really? Now. Yeah, we're looking Already? at new building. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So at the back of our building, we're looking at building a new oh, building. Oh, that empty that, expense. Yes, yeah. a wasteland, because <laughs> it's not good grass for it's not good ground for growing grass grass on. But yeah, that area at the back is we're looking at a new building. Oh, yeah. But I think that's there's there's yeah different ideas for that. But yeah, we've we've already filled up all the space. So one of the nice things I didn't really mention this because it's a little bit. I tried to sort of stick to the computy things, but it's the stuff that's fun to be honest. So. The Roslyn Franklin building, if I can ever find it, there we go, is kind of really nicely designed because it's got four floors. And um, the bottom floor is like concrete slab that's piled down to base rock for a large portion of it so that it's super stable for the electron microscopes. And this area here is actually two floors high because the electron microscopes are all really tall. And the new ones that we want to do are even taller than they normally would be. So this is like, um, yeah, this is a really tall room. Um, it's very, very, very big. So you've got plenty of vertical height and nicely shielded and everything like this. And also this is where we have all the mass spec imaging is on the ground floor. We have any of the, most of the microscopes and stuff on the ground floor because they're nice and stable. Then the first floor is the useless floor. And that contains all the office staff and my team uh, because it's got no general benefit. Uh, actually, I think that the second floor is also not so useful either. And that contains all the structural biology. 
but then the top floor is where all the chemists live and that is literally filled with fume hoods because you're right next to the roof so that you can do all the extraction for the fume hoods. So yeah, so when they built the building, they very much designed it for the fact that we put all the chemists at the top with the best fumes, which is disgraceful, but because it's close to the top for the fume hoods, microscopes at the bottom, and then everybody else lives in between because it doesn't really matter where they go. Um, however, yeah, all of the bottom is now full with, with bits of kit and we're starting to repurpose random rooms. Course, so there's a couple yeah. of storage rooms and a workshop that are being, uh, we can fit a microscope in there and, and this kind of thing, so. Yeah, so a form follows function. Yes. You've also got the top level cafe, <laughs> which is very difficult to access. You have to be in the right discipline to get to that, don't you? No idea. No, right. So, oh, where is it? it? It's there. It's this little tiny bit here. It's a slight balcony um, and it overlooks his office. Um, <laughs> but it's, um, we're not supposed to go on it. And uh, the, the tellings off that people got from accessing it were, were, were big. But it's, um, it's, it's really bad because it would be the perfect place to, to go out and have a, a coffee. Um, but the only problem is that the room literally next to it is like a full lab with fume hoods and stuff. So you're in with lab coat, goggles, everything like this. And the only, then you'd have to sort of traipse through it to get into the, the open area. So they did consider putting down carpet and stuff at one point to try and make it accessible. But no, no, certainly That's not. Shame. Yeah. Certainly not. So do you have um, tools of external visitors or students? So actually, it's really interesting. So, so on site, if you ever get the opportunity to go to the Harwell campus, Diamond does an amazing tour because they show you everything. It's really cool. We can't because yeah. we've got so much proprietary stuff uh, because we work very, very closely with all the manufacturers. So people like Thermo Fisher, Joel, um, we can show bits of the building, but we can't show all of the building. And unfortunately, all the bits of the building that we can't show are the exciting cool bits. So you just get to see a load of office space. And, and a load of fume hoods. If, you, if you're into chemistry and you want to see fume hoods, there are so many fume hoods upstairs, it's unbelievable. Uh, but apart from that, yeah, everything else is there. Uh, Mark, it's been an exciting problem and certainly wonderful progress so far. And uh, um, I just wonder, um, so I think so yes, many years ago, you had the connect between uh, the, the neural imaging problem was always the, the major challenge actually was the validation. So when you apply the the algorithm actually you don't know if the algorithm correct or not i guess you must have the same problem with body mesh data that you kind of uh, try to look into to see whether the machine does a good job or not absolutely and that's one of the things that we've got so with a lot of the connectomic stuff we want to try and steal as much of that as we can it's really hard because most of it was just done by lots and lots of people at google um Lots of people at Google. They had a lot of uh, a lot of effort, a lot of money in there. So yeah. So the bit that we do to try and address this to a certain extent is when we do this prediction, because we predict in all the different directions, it gives us some idea of quality, and that's actually what we use when we go to the when we look at these big. As you, I said we do this bit. We see it's not very good in other places. The way we know it's not very good in other places is because our predictions are incompatible with one another and that's because we're training on such a small amount of data right if we have huge amounts of data it'd be fine but because we've got a small amount of data even you notice there's problems like if you predict on my hand like this and you predict on my hand like this it will get different predictions when you rotate it back and then you know you've not got enough data and so yeah it's that's the validation level that we're putting in and so trying to explore that fully to get the best out of it to really understand where we've got good can, yeah, good accuracy where we haven't. So sometimes the, the validation is often sort of driven by the, the uh, sort of classification or segmentation people, which is the one sort of hundred percent correct sort of segmentation and percent classification. Actually, if you think of a validation down the pipeline, sometimes actually to do with the same the statistics, the percentage of certain type of uh, material and so on. So actually the validation itself doesn't need to be 100% in some way. So I noticed uh, sometimes the effort made may not be necessarily useful, like the, you're dealing with, the, say, filling the layers, missing layers. But if the statistics are about the material, not about the big chunk structure, but about the material on the sand, but you actually don't need necessarily filling those structures out of the material. You just sort of calculate based on what you sample. Uh, no, you're absolutely right. So. 
I guess there's two there's two things that I, I like to pick up on. One of them is I'm really, really um, lucky to work with Michelle Darrow. And she came into this um, from a user point of view and they started doing some work over in, uh, I think it was Berkeley uh, with the work they were doing, where they discovered that if you get three experts to segment the same thing, they come up with vastly different answers. And at that point, we realized that the ground truth you get from people is pretty much worth it. Well, it's not worthless, but it's really calling it ground truth is a massive thing. So we call all of our annotated data from people gold standard because we don't treat it as ground truth for exactly those purposes. Um, so uh, one of the things we really want to do, so we're actually doing a lot of work. I didn't talk about it here, but we're doing a lot of work with citizen science where instead of getting a couple of people to segment something, we try to get hundreds of people to segment it and then use the fact that because a lot of them are novices in what we're asking them to do, so they're not thinking of it. We're trying to ask them questions like spot the difference or just color the different regions rather than telling them explicitly pick the mitochondria, which your experts then have opinions about what different things are. Um, that can actually really help unbiased the data and give you really nice um, training. In terms of the error stuff, you're absolutely spot on. And I'd love to do that. Um, I think the problem that we've got at the moment is that we have, although we've kind of partially automated this, the bit we then need to automate is the, what do you want to do with this to make your graph? And can I draw on this? Is that, is that okay? Um, I'm not going to tell you you can't. No. I'm just going to draw on this. Please go ahead. Yeah. Okay, I can, I can move. I think I just need to go in front of the door. There we go. So, so the, um, I was going to say, so basically, yeah, because what we really want to do is you want to have something like the graph that comes out of this, where you've got like, I don't know, not a biologist, so I'm just going to make something up. So you've got, I know, temperature that you'd run the study at along this one. So you've got temp. And then you've got number or, or some metrics. So I'll call it number of ribosomes or something here. And exactly, so when you do the initial experiment, you do initial segmentation, maybe you see some points with some nice big error bars and you go, great, I can do nothing with this. So I'm now going to put some effort in to do some more segmentation. But now I start to see that I've got, I've dropped my error bars slightly because I've done more segmentation. And all of a sudden, ah, you know what, I've got a decent trend there. And actually, even through the worst case scenario, it's still an upward trend. That's proved my point. And exactly as you said, there's no point in me going to tiny error bars because I'll still see an upward trend and that's all I care about. That's, this is my holy grail. If I could get to this, then that'd be amazing. But it involves basically mapping all of the downstream processing that you want to do after you've done the segmentation in at the same time and trying to make that as automatic as possible to roll it in. But yeah, this would be amazing because I'm sure Absolutely positive, even though we're reducing the time, people are doing a lot more work than they have to do to get the results they want. Uh, thank you, Mark. It's very, very interesting. Um, this may come across as slightly naive because I, I'm not familiar with this field. Mm -hmm. I'm not familiar with that much with Python. Um, and I know Python is the go to language for machine learning, the libraries out there, PyTorch, etc. Um, but I'm also aware that there's a competitor, a competitor coming out of MIT called Julia, yeah. which is, uh, if applied correctly, is considerably faster than Python and lots of tasks. Yeah. But you've got obviously a huge investment in, in Python. Is, is, is Julia possibly a potential future language for this area, for this area of work? It's, it's really interesting. But so I think. So Julia is quicker, if I, if I understand correctly, Julia is quicker at kind of, that there's a lot of things you can do very nicely in Julia. Yeah. But if you're, if the thing you want to do in Python is really slow, then someone will optimize it yeah. and we'll get it onto the, now most of the work that we do is actually accelerate on GPUs. And so when you go to GPU, kind of all bets are off because yeah. you're because you're off on GPU land. Yeah, so we've lost your camera. Oh, sorry. And mm -hmm. yeah. um, so yeah, sorry. So GPUs yeah, kind of all so bets are off. The of the GPU, yeah. Right. And so yeah, so most of the stuff that we do is on GPU, so we don't really mind. But I think one of the things I'm I really like the idea of um, one of the things I want to do with this sort of automatic processing, 
we've talked about one model, there's loads of stuff going on and we can't do specific work for all of them. The um, Jupyter Notebooks, for example, um, one of the so our collaborators over at Diamond have done an amazing piece of work where they, um, for a particular experiment, the Beamline staff can set up a Jupyter Notebook, which they then automatically run every time the data comes in mm -hmm. and produces them a PDF or HTML output, which is kind of the report of that, yeah. that processing. Now, the nice thing about Jupyter Notebooks is you can technically run it in Julia or R or yeah. Python, whichever you fancy. Um, and at some point I should really learn Julia because I know that I keep going to Python as my go-to language time. and uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's there. It's interesting. An interesting development. Yeah, I, I think definitely. And um, I think especially GPUs are hard to use as well and they're getting, they're getting more complicated. So the last time we did some testing um, at Diamond, I think we found that to make it cost effective to use a GPU, mm -hmm. you have to get a 60 times performance increase over a single core. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't get a 60 times performance increase, then it's just cheaper to buy more cores when you buy your compute than to buy GPUs mm -hmm. because they're expensive. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, we didn't do the calculation with power because they're slightly less power hungry, although they're independently in the very power hungry, they're slightly less power hungry than lots of cores. But I think with some of the newer architectures that are coming out with many, many cores, actually things like Julia may well become more important because they, I think they deal with parallel processing yeah. a lot better yeah. and, and yeah. that kind of thing. So yeah, I think there's definitely some interesting areas. Can I ask, um, um, uh, two quick questions. Um, firstly, couldn't you use pre-trained models um, trained on histology images, which there's tons and tons and tons of both, I mean, which are pre-trained. And second question was, is a, this is quite naive, but, how can you tell me how is your image reconstruction different for cryo ET as compared to uh, computer tomography as a CT scan? Yeah, so um, with the it's an interesting question. So with the history, with the because you're right, um, like standard X-ray CT images are grayscale. They're much closer to the types of volume data that we've got. Um, I wasn't actually aware of a decent pre-trained model on histology data, but that may just be that I'm not. I've, I've not looked recently, but if there are decent pre-trained models of that, I'd be really interested in trying them. They are um, pre-trained models, but not decent at all. Oh, okay, that's fair enough. Okay, well, so we'll... Send you as well, but anyway, yeah. No, that's, that's, I think, yeah, because it would be worthwhile looking into, because, yeah, at the moment, as I say, we use um, the, the sort of the ResNet yeah. standard trained stuff, which is, we then have to deliberately flatten the images and stuff like this to, to make it work. Doing stuff with, with histology images would be quite interesting and be potentially very, very nice. Um, in terms of the second one, the actually the reconstruction algorithms are very, very similar. So you can just use standard uh, filter back projection. There's a slight difference that we use. So the very subtle difference is we use a technique called weighted back projection because we usually have this kind of geometry rather than a circle shape. And because it's a slab, when you tilt it up at angles, you get a very different um, amount of absorption because of the high tilt. So Weighted back projection just compensates for that slightly. Um, actually, where most people go is they go with the iterative techniques like certain and SART and CGLS, um, which because you've got a smaller number of projections become tenable with this kind of data. Whereas with micro CT, at least where you've got thousands and thousands of projections, they're computationally very expensive. Um, I don't know about medical CT. I think medical CT sometimes goes to certain SART, but I think I know there's there's a lot of um, filter back projection as well. Again, probably a fairly basic question. It's not not really not really my field, but then I was kind of interested in your immune system um, sort of um, evolution yeah. model. In, in terms of how, in terms of, I assume that you when you sort of start out with Chrome, you were using more traditional genetic models. What kind of computing time difference do you actually see when attempting this? Because this is sort of new to me. Right. So it was very much because of our problem. Mm -hmm. So. What I had to do was so with the way the, the problem works to say to, to simply because it's um it takes hours to change these magnets. So you imagine they're very, very powerful magnets, so they have to get special rigs to take them out yeah. and swap them over. And what you're interested in is you build the system up and then you take a measurement and then you so the first thing you want to do is put them all in the right order and then you start measuring and stuff like this. So um you, you, can't, you can't measure the things as you're going, so you have to simulate it to work out what's going on. And it's the simulation that takes the time. So when you 
basically the simulation is all about magnetic fields. When you put the array in place, you have to basically take the magnetic field of each of these items, calculate it for this enormous space that you're, you're dealing with, and you then have to sum it to all of the other large arrays. So this becomes these big, big, massive lookup tables that you're summing together. If I want to change, if I want to basically swap out half of the magnets and put them back in, I have to recalculate for the half of the magnets that I'm putting back in. Um, and I have to, if there's any fixing, I have to also recalculate those elements. What we realized was that when you swap, if you just do a very simple um, uh, mutation, which is just to swap two magnets, then all you have to actually do is subtract one magnet from the whole array and then add the one you put back in, back into the whole array. So all of a sudden you reduce the complexity of that problem. And because that's the expensive bit in calculating your objective function, that means that although this converges slower than a, a genetic algorithm, so especially differential evolution or something like this, they work really well. This converges slower, but because of that trick, especially when you've got 200 odd magnets, calculating the objective function is about two orders of magnitude faster with this method. Mm -hmm. So hence the trade-off then weighs in benefit for this. But it's only because of the fact that we can play tricks with the objective function that we can't play with genetic algorithms where you're fully replacing large chunks of the, the magnetic group without pre-caching loads of information. And the results you got in, do they kind of, do they, does it all converge to say, well, does it to be equally as, as optimal a solution as it would do from a traditional definition, or is it, do you end up with very slightly worse results? Oh, we get basically the same sort of result because we can generally, I mean, I think this is the thing. So the, the time we, so we calculate this on a large cluster to do the calculations and we run that for maybe a week mm -hmm. to do the same thing with a GA would take several years. So we can't afford <laughs> to do it. So if we run it for the same amount of time with the GA, we generally get a worse result. Okay. But if you look at kind of the prediction of where it might get to, then the GA might get to a better place. Mm -hmm. But as I say, the interesting thing with this, because it's a sorting problem and you have to fix, you actually, because you're having to do a fixed step where you're saying, okay, well, magnet 53 appears twice. And so I need to swap it out with something. I think you break quite a few of the assumptions of a GA from the mathematical point of view. Mm -hmm. um, I'm working on slightly loose ground here, but I, I'm pretty sure you break some of the assumptions that means that it guarantee will converge and give you the best result, which I think is roughly true if you're not making those fixes. Right. So that was the thing. So we sort of objectively saw that it gave us a really nice result in comparison. That it looks like the GA would probably get better, but in more time than we can give it to compute, and it may not. And I guess that's the, that's where we then sort of left it and said, well, yeah, this is it. Because the other thing is, all of this is based on initial magnet measurements. And these magnets are particularly finicky. So if you uh, like knock them or chip them slightly, it changes all of their properties. And because as you can imagine, I mean, the, the magnetic field, so this is the top bar and this is the bottom bar. So these are, they're about that big and they're neodymium magnets. Mm -hmm. So the magnetic field between the two of them when they're brought together is about, it's about a Tesla. So it's a massive magnetic field. So the getting these out of here and putting them back in again is really complicated and they often get slightly broken. They're not the most robust of things. So actually the process of physically building it often changes the behavior enough that you have to make some fixes. So getting super perfect first time doesn't really matter because you're going to make a, you're going to make some mistakes anyway, but you do need to get close enough that they can then fix it up in further steps. That is really interesting. Thank you. But it's a cool problem, yeah. With some of the pre, uh, if you store the pre, some of the previous simulation results, could that be reused in the future? Some of the algorithm searching for the optimization. Um, possibly, but each one is completely bespoke. Right? So most of the new systems, these are all made specifically. So actually, one of the big problems that we've had to do recently with, uh, so hopefully, um, we're just about to publish. Unfortunately. We're publishing in a proceedings journal, which is with the IOP, and they just had to redact 500 journal proceedings because of um, not great science. So we're really hoping that um, ours was supposed to be coming out this month, so you can actually have a look at it, but I don't know whether that's going to be delayed slightly or not. Um, but yeah, the problem we've got at the moment is that they keep changing the design of these magnets. because So essentially, they design the whole thing based on very specific things, assuming perfect magnets. 
And so the shape of these with the little chamfer edges and stuff is all to get the right magnetic field. And because this is quite an evolving, they keep trying to push the boundaries, those designs change almost every single device. So every device is a unique system. So we probably could, but only if they happen to build the same thing twice and they generally don't, which is mildly annoying. But yeah, we have to do quite a lot of work because when they make it more complicated than that, you have to do quite a lot of modeling to work out what the actual magnetic impact is. Okay, do we have any questions from the Zoom session? No, in which case, I think we should thank our speaker again. Yeah.